Well, thank you, Robert, for having me here. I, first time I've, um, Susan introduced me to this forum uh, about a month ago. I didn't even know it existed. I was always a part of the Silicon Valley Health Institute, which used to be called Smart Life. And then I've been lecturing at New Living Expo for about 20, 30 years now. And uh, done a lot of research and worked with UCLA and Stanford and Ohio State University Medical Center. I'm on the board with Florida AMM, um, Dr. Elizabeth Mazio, and our work with his anti-inflammatories, uh, remedies for cancer, uh, for longevity. So we're doing a lot of state-of-the-art uh, uh, research over there, looking at different uh, compounds in nature and natural healing, herbs, and finding out what, how each one works and why they work, et cetera. So she's publishing a lot of papers on this. It's Elizabeth Mazio, if you want to read her. She's at Florida AMM University, and she's a good friend of mine. We just spent two hours talking a few nights ago. Um, well, you know, I've been, uh, I started out as a uh, physical therapist in the 70s, and I had a very strong training with uh, structural problems like low backs and shoulders and orthopedic medicine, et cetera. And then uh, I worked, I got a second degree in chiropractic, and I went back to school in 78 and graduated in 81. And um, while I was in school, I actually ended up working at UCLA as a professional, as a chiropractor rehab and trainer and nutritionist uh, for the use uh, for the 1980 Olympics and the 1984 Olympics and the 1988 Olympics. And while I was working there, I ended up working with the uh, Los Angeles Rams, Los Angeles Ra uh, Lakers, the Raiders, and San Diego Chargers, and Kansas City Chiefs, and many, and the Clippers, and many professional teams. So I had a very strong foundation with sports medicine, myself competing in sports, playing uh, semi-professional soccer all my life. So I, that foundation gave me some ideas of where I wanted to go. But what really started me was uh, my education with Edgar Casey. I don't know if you're aware of Edgar Casey's work. Uh, that's what led me really into what I'm doing today. Um, I was working with uh, many Edgar Casey's foundation individuals who were medical doctors and PhDs at, as, a, as a physical therapist, and they invited me to come to uh, Arizona in 1976 and to experience their work. And there I met some incredible people I couldn't even realize they were out there. And that's what started me and my foundation with the remote viewing world and learning how to do it and how to experience it. And I was told that I, my father or my mother was born with this kind of capability and I was able to use it. Because you have to be aware of the um, brain chemistry and how it works. We're all antennas and we're all receivers. Certain people have the um, value and effects to even increase that ability to promote more deltron wavelengths, alpha wavelengths, and delta and beta, all of those. And at Stanford, I was worked, I ended up working at the SRI department there and doing, um, uh, looking at people and seeing how we can change cancer cells with electromagnetic fields. And that's how I got started at the department at the SRI. But at UCLA, I started working in alternative to steroid and looking at nutrition and how we can do with nutrition to improve, enhance performance and recovery. And so it took me back 40, 50 years now to where I'm today 
And I wanted to really understand more is who are we? How do we get to this planet? How did we come here? So uh, when I was at um, UCLA, I decided I wanted to learn more about who we are and what created us. And it was a very interesting experience. You know, you learn by going, you know, around and around and you're discovering that you are really discovering the beginning of life and how we got here. And that's what made me a better physician, a better intuitive person, a person that can help people now much more. I've always helped people. I was investigated. I got attacked by the FDA for curing cancer and other diseases. And I had a lot of trauma that for, you know, for about a few years. Luckily, I had a uh, patient who was an FDA attorney who um, helped me out with this situation and got me completely um, out of it. And I never had to really uh, lose my license or my practice, but the other three doctors did because they went a little further in trying to promote it in ways that they shouldn't have done it on television. And so one of the things I'm gonna tell you, they don't want a cure, okay? They told me this. They verbally have told me this on the phone. They don't want a cure for cancer. They don't want a cure for weight loss. They even said weight loss. And I wasn't even working on that, you know? They didn't want anything that the medical world, the pharmaceutical world can make money, okay? We have, an RNA, we have a mitochondria that should give us at least 110, 115 years of life. So that's what I came up with, is going back and figuring out what created us and who are we and what makes us work and what is the requirement for us to continue surviving and living and enjoying life and not getting sick. So understanding I can work structurally with you with low back and shoulders, that's not a problem. But I wanted to go beyond that and find out what else can we do? How can we increase the energy of the cells? And I've learned one thing. It's what Otto Warburg says, what Douglas Wallace has said, uh, what um, Koch has said, what Saleh has said. Some of the greatest minds came up in the 1800s, 1900s. And why? Our brain was working differently than it is today. And I'll talk to you about what's going on today and what the future looks like. <laughs> but going back to understanding uh, when there was no electricity and we were living outdoors, the human body worked differently than what we're working today. There's more stress in the body, there's more inflammation than it ever has been. I see people in the 20s and 30s and 40s now with uh, dementia, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, cognitive decline, cancer. Young people, when I started in the 80s, 70s and 80s, all I saw was lower back problems and maybe knee problems and maybe aches and pains. And remember the old salesman, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the salesman that drove in the car? Well, that's who I saw, back problems, sitting in a car. That was the common thing we saw in those days. Today is totally different. People have no energy anymore. Depression, anxiety. They can't sleep more than six. Uh, how many people sleep eight hours straight? Very seldom you're gonna find somebody that, you know, is gonna have that ability. One of the things I, I ask a patient, and most doctors don't, they just want to give you prescribed medication. I ask my patient, 
When you get up in the morning, do you have a lot of energy? Do you feel good? Are you ready to go? Okay. I ask, how do you sleep at night? Do you get a very good night's sleep? At least six, seven, eight hours straight? Or do you constantly get up or you can't, you can't stop your mind from thinking all the time? That's a problem. We can't relax our brain anymore. We don't know how to do it. And that's because of the information in the environment that we created. Um, so going back in time, Douglas Wallace has published many papers, and he's a brilliant uh, MD. It's all about this mitochondria. This is the battery of the cell. That's who we are. Every disease is based on the energy function of this mitochondria. Every disease, 95% of our diseases and aging factors and health is linked to the mitochondria. What is the mitochondria? It's a, it's a fireplace, okay, that burns fuel for energy. It's ATP. It came, across, uh, came upon us about four billion years ago. And then about 600 million years ago, chloroplasts, which is a material needed for life in the plants, chlorophyll and all that, which is magnesium, was developed by the mitochondria 600 million years ago where plant started existing on this planet. All these meteors and comets gave the foundation to this planet in a solar system and one energy system in our planet the sun started maturing, and it took almost 14 billion years of this sun to develop. And once this sun developed and matured itself, about 600 million years ago, it, w it gave us plant life. And about 500 million years ago, this sun started developing even more and being stronger and energized and created more uh, radiation that we needed. And this UVA, B, C was predominantly maturing about 500 million years ago and went across our universe through the solar, through the environment, and hit the earth and the ozone layer around the earth with the UV light and the sun gave us a higher degree of oxygen. 15% of oxygen to 21, 25% oxygen. And guess what? About three million, billion years ago, there was a bacteria named LUCA, L-U-C-A, which is all published in science. This bacteria was created by thermodynamic functions from the ocean, from the minerals, from the temperature. Is the first time this element, mitochondria, started developing. And this mitochondria took many millions and billions of years to uh, develop itself to about 500 million years ago when the UV light was at an exceptionally high point that we started developing life, human uh, sea life, vet, reptilians before humans. Humans came around around 300 million years ago. Okay.
okay? Because the mitochondria was perfectly developed. It encapsulated itself. It was, there's an electron chamber, five of them, that gives us what we need for energy. And how we use that chamber, electron one, two, three, four, five. How fast the electron travel through this respiratory chamber in the mitochondria is who we are today and our health is the, developed by these electrons. All the food we take, all the water we drink, get split into electrons and protons and photons. And without the sun, you and I wouldn't be here. Without the sun, the mitochondria wouldn't be operating today. It needs photon energies in order to make ATP. Why is everybody so tired and sick and everybody's on the medication? Because we live in a different environment. We eliminate some of the most important things for us to continue functioning. And that's sunlight and indoor technology, which the human body wasn't developed for. They were gatherers, okay? It wasn't until we discovered fire, how to cook meat, hundreds of years ago, or a hundred thousand years ago, that we were able to change the brain and in, increase the capability of this brain to function, to be more creative. Because when we learn to cook food, we lessen the ability of this mandible for digesting. That's why tigers and lions, they, can, they bite and they can digest because they have the strongest mandible. We did too, the humans did at one time. But when we made everything more digestible, all food more digestible, we created a brain, an intelligence. Because all that energy here went to here. We didn't need to digest as hard as before. In the animal kingdom, you still have tigers and lions needing to digest with this but they haven't developed a brain like the humans. We're, the, we're, we're rare humans, capabilities. In the early, before the 1888, when electricity was discovered, right? And who discovered AC? Tesla. Tesla. That's when sickness and disease started. Interesting. It came up in the 1888 when AC, electricity, was developed and put together in all of Europe and then the United States, et cetera, that we had kerosene and then we had artificial lighting. That's what it is, artificial lighting. We changed the human, the natural lighting we get from the sun to artificial, and we're living in an artificial world today. And that's what's happening, and that's why we're actually getting sick and deteriorating and having all kinds of problems. So Douglas Wallace has said that all diseases is based on this energy mechanism called the mitochondria that controls our immunity, Ability to see, focus, to actually see. Why in Korea and China, more people, young people in their early uh, 12, 13, 14 years old are now wearing glasses? Anybody can tell me? All of that, all of that. You're all right. All of you are correct. They're on the computers, videos, cell phones. 
And cultures that do that, when they start that early, they lose the eyesight. And this, this Robson, rots and cones that we need every day to start our circadian, our body to work again, our hormones to work again, our melatonin to work again, needs sunlight. So you need to get out 7, 8, 9, 10 in the morning and expose yourself to sunrise and that opens up the Robsons and the all the rots and cones to get our circadian, our hormone, our melatonin, our growth hormone to function again and our immune system to work again. And all of us are indoors. We don't get out. What's the first thing you do when you get up? Most people check their phones. You're right. They check the phones, their emails, and their texts, right? And what is that doing to us? It's putting out the wrong vibrational frequency and light. We're not getting the blue, the red light, the blue, uh, we get, we have to have some blue light in the morning, but we're not getting enough, the full spectrum of the red light, the infrared light, the spectrum of the sun. And that's what gave us vision. And we're not doing that anymore. So the first thing you do is get up, go outside, get some sunlight, and then you can go back in and then do what you need to do. But you need to expose yourself as much as you can. And I see that with people. When I see a cancer patient, and I've had more cancer patients than I really wanted, but, you know, nobody out there knows how to treat it correctly, and that's a problem, because they don't understand about energy, medicine, oxidative metabolism, what Otto Warburg has described in the 1900s, and Koch and Soleil and other people like that, and Douglas Wallace, is energy deficiency. We have trillions of these cells in our body. They provide us stem cells, they provide us immunity, they provide us uh, how our muscle works, how our nerves work, how our brain works. The mitochondria is a fuel, it's an energy, it's a, it's a fireplace. Just think of that. And that is what we have to keep going and make sure that we can increase that ability of the mitochondria to function on a daily base. And I studied as much as I can about this one organelle for about 20, 30 years now. And I wanted to find out what drives that organism up, what increases the NAD levels, the oxidative metabolism, all of that. What foods? what nutritional supplements, and the sun. Probably the sun is the most important nutrient we have today that drives the mitochondria. That's why there's more sickness today than ever before. I gave a lecture about uh, two th in the 2000s I went to Chicago about three or four times to lecture to a major organization there. And I was driven down there, and I was picked up by the airport, from the airport, driven to my conference. And he took me through a tour of Chicago in an area, and he showed me a hospital there and a whole block, three or four blocks three or four blocks of a new building. And he says, you know what that's going to be? I said, no, what is it? That's your next oncology uh, building. It's three blocks long. They knew something about ca cancer that I guess they were preparing and, and creating a hospital just based on that. They saw something was coming, the next, you know, growth in financial. 
And I'm going, interesting, you know? And now I understand why it's happening, you know? Because one of the first things I ask every single cancer person that I work with, how much exposure to sunlight do you get a day? How much indoor do you spend a day? How much time in front of a computer or television or cell phone do you spend a day? I need to know this because I have to take you out of that and give you nature. And that's the thing that we're missing. And then understanding this and understanding that this oxidative metabolism, this NAD cycling that we need, electrons are flowing through the chamber. And that chamber gives us energy, the fuel called ATP. In that, mitre, in that electron chamber number five, where ATP is produced, there's an, a spin, a battery in there that spins, that takes your oxygen and your electrons and it spins the fuel. All the food we eat has to be made into what? For energy. Glucose. Glucose. Do not be afraid of glucose. Do not be afraid of sugar. Oh, everybody's on a low sugar diet. Fat. Most of my cancer patients who are not doing well, they come to me because they are being told no sugar. No sugar. And then we'll talk about fats, which I can tell you is another serious problem we have. So we need sugar. We need sugar because the fuel that is taken from all the nutrients we're eating today gets broken down by the electron, by the oxygen, as a chemical reaction in chamber five, there's a spin to make glucose, ATP, energy, the fuel, the gasoline, okay? There's so many interruptions that go on between chamber one to chamber five, and that's what I wanted to know and learn about so that I can correct those interactions and improve them so that I know how to treat everything else. Osteoarthritis, um, bone loss, everything is all controlled by that mechanism. Everything. I spend most of my days outdoors. I don't go inside, I don't use, I hardly use a computer or cell phone. And if I do, I'm gonna teach you how to take care of it. There is no gadget out there, anxiety disorder and many other conditions. When I was in practice, I have noticed a lot of uh, teachers, these are teachers coming into me with fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue and depression, anxiety disorder, and I, started learning. I learned John Ott in the 80s and all that. So one of the things I asked the teacher, are you right under fluorescent lighting? And they said, oh, we are. We are. The whole school is, the classroom. That's why they're all getting sick. That's why children get sick. They don't need a vaccine, friends. The worst thing in the world is vaccination. Flu vaccination. I had a fight with one of my patients who was a manufacturer of all the vaccines we have today. And he argued for five years with me, and then in the fifth year when I was leaving LA to move up here, he said, Bern, you know what, I didn't want to uh, agree with you because I'm a manufacturer of vaccines, but you are absolutely right. Do not get vaccinated. He told me that. Robert Lawrence, I remember him. And then I found out he sold the company. So he made one good thing. So you don't need to be vaccinated because our immune system is there for us to learn and pick up 
information. Every time we get a flu or cold or virus, we have a B cell, a T cell, and a natural killer cell that recognizes and tags and goes after it and gets rid of it naturally. And we learn how to develop that by going to nature and learning how to expose ourselves to the elements out there. Every time somebody comes in, and I get it all the time, I get people with colds and flus coming in my office for 30, 40 years. I developed every immunity there is out there. I never get sick, never. Never, I never get sick because I build an immunity to everything. And the mitochondria is there to help me do that because I keep that mitochondria functioning as, as best I can from what I learn how to do that. As long as I do that, they're not gonna get me these doctors. They're gonna lose money on me, you know? And that's what I want them. I want them to go bankrupt. I want the system to finally go down. And this corruption. The only time you're gonna need a doctor is when you have a, an accident, you know, and, uh, and you need a bone uh, breaker or some auto accident or something, you're gonna need them, okay? But most of the time you don't. It's all about your diet and how you expose yourself to the elements out there. And the other thing is also, you know, um, how many people wear sunglasses when they go outside? The worst thing you can ever do in your life is wear sunscreen and sunglasses. The worst thing you can do. The worst thing you can do. Every time you put sunscreen and you go outside, you call mutation of the mitochondria. It gets damaged. And then you have the UV light hits it, it causes more damage. And the UV light is so essential to our health. We need it. How many of you drive a car with the windows closed? You need to open those windows when you drive a car. You need that UV light to go through and, it, and the windows, the panels, protect the UV from entering. When you open the window up in your house, in your apartment, anywhere you live, this UV light has the ability to go in different angles. <coughs> and that has to go through because what created life is sun and UV. Why do people live longer in high altitudes? Closer to the sun, it's high UV. That's right. Altitude is better until they get exposed. Right, high UV. One of the areas I did a lot, a lot of work was in longevity. I wanted to find out who lives the longest and why. There are areas in the Caucasus Mountains in Georgia. They are in the hundreds. And I found out because of the high UV elevation and another element out there that's very high is what? Carbon dioxide, CO2. The most powerful antioxidant we have today is CO2. It's not vitamin E, it's not vitamin D, it's not vitamin C, it's CO2. Carbonic acid written by in, in, in 1900, 1906, by Dr. Ross, um, it's called carbonic acid in medicine. And how CO2 is so powerful as an anti-inflammatory, as an in, immune in, enhancer, as an antioxidant, it's the molecule that is released by the mitochondria, ATP, into water and CO2. That's the key. So you need to do CO2. I do CO2 breathing every single day, seven days a week. 
I would recommend that you learn how to do it. And there's two ways I, I, I teach my clients and patients and all that, is you know how to do a bag breathing. Where you breathe in a paper bag you, uh, for about a minute, and you do that once or twice a day as much as you can, that's called CO2 breathing. That lowers blood pressure immediately. That overcomes many conditions that you start, uh, any uh, diseases, and it helps with building calcium into the bone. Acetylzolamide, you know what acetylzolamide, Susan knows, right? It's used in high altitude. People who go to high altitude, they don't do well because they don't have, they, they don't have enough CO2 in their uh, red blood cells and, and carrying through the lungs, so they have to take acetylzolamide. Acetylzolamide had a very interesting study that increases bone density in people with low, with osteoporosis or loss of bone or cartilage in their bones. It's just because CO2 binds the calcium into the bones, and that's how important it is. The other way to do CO2 breathing is take a deep breath through your nose and hold it for about four to 10 seconds and then release it slowly for about eight to 10 seconds as much as you can. And that's why swimmers, what do you think swimmers are excellent athletes? Not because of chlorine, that can, that's the only problem. A good swimmer, and I used to swim in college, was that, and I didn't know this, but you breathe every four turns, you know, every four strokes or six. You hold your breath in the water. One of the things we did when I was coaching at UCLA, the athletes there, we swam under the water from one end to the other without, hold, uh, without breathing. And that increases CO2 capacity. One of the other things we did when I was coaching the Olympic teams, and I ran track and field in college, and the 68 Olympics came up, the guys I ran against were all members of the 68 Olympics. And they all went to Mexico City, but we all trained in high altitude. In 84, one of the things was, I had a fellow by the name of Bob Dratch from Colorado build us a CO2 chamber so that you can train under CO2 conditions in uh, UCLA, Colorado, and other locations. So we build these chambers for our athletes to train, to enhance their performance, the recovery. Everything is based on recovery, recovery. Lactic acid is, is, is one of the highest inflammation in our blood, you know, and why do we get cramps and, and tightness and uh, low energy? It's lactic acid, and CO2 and lactic acid is the two things I look in a blood test, and those two tell me so much about the individual, about their cancer, anything. I want to lower lactic acid, increase CO2. And there was an Italian fellow, Jim Nimi, who got, uh, lost his license to practice uh, cancer. He was in 60 minutes one day and he um, was interviewed and after that he lost his license because he was injecting baking soda into the cancer cells because he was increasing the CO2 components of the cells. And that's the simplest thing you can do every single day. Take a teaspoon of baking soda in warm water with lemon and drink it every day. Once, twice, three times a day. Keep your CO2 going. Keeps the lactic acid inflammation down and disease can survive in that environment. Cancer cells cannot survive. So simple things we can do baking soda, et cetera, breathing, back breathing, taking a deep breath, holding it for four, eight seconds, letting it out, eight to 10 seconds, do it again. 
Do it four, five, six times, ten times. Every day we can do that. Like I said, I wanted to go back to the chemistry of life, how we got here. We got here because of the temperature was 72 degrees. It was called the continent of uh, the Falange, which was in South Africa. The, uh, the temperature was perfect. The nutrients in the soil, in the ocean, was perfect. The uh, thermodynamic of the ocean ground, of the, there was a lot of volcanic going on there. Every, our DNA, RNA was developed because of that. The organelle mitochondria was developed because it had the right media of nutrients in the water to create this. And then when the soil, uh, this bacteria started uh, developing and chloroplasts started developing, the oxygen, hydrogen levels in the atmosphere changed. And 500 million years ago, we had the perfect oxygen levels in the atmosphere. And we had the right ozone labels, levels in the atmosphere with UV coming down together created oxygen. And we had water and we had temperatures that were perfect and we had enough salt in the ocean that gave rise to all these organisms and all these sea lives and all of that. And then we developed 300 million years ago because we had the right elements. Going back, what did we eat when we were 200, 300 million years ago? 100 million years, 65,000 years ago. Things we picked on the way from where we were walking, anything that probably fell dead and we picked up and scavenged, or anything we could beat with a stick or a rock that was slow enough to be caught. That's right. We should do that. <laughs> we were hunters, basically. We were eating animals, uh, game, wild game, fish. Those that wander through Africa, our ancestral background came from that direction. 23andMe can tell you that. So if you come from an equator that's more southern, what are you going to have more in the equator? Sun, sun, sun. So Africa was a perfect location for the right nutrients, so we had all the sun we needed. And that's why we were dark skin. As we walked, in those days, uh, 300 million years ago, 200 million years ago, the continents were together. We weren't separate. We didn't have the uh, oceans and the volcanics, you know, separating us. So we can go and we can go and walk 10 miles and we hit New Zealand, we hit Australia, we hit India. We developed, adapted. We were hunters, but we were movers. We wanted to move and develop new lands and, you know, cultivation and we civilizations and things like that, as we went further north, we had to change. Our chemistry has to change. And we have to adapt to that. So we became more hairy, right? Because it became colder. Our skin became whiter, so we needed more vitamin D. And we needed to move to altitudes that were higher, so we get more UV. So we made all these changes ourselves. So one of the things you need to understand, what do we eat predominantly in those times? And our stomach, our colon, was designed 100 to 200,000 years ago. It was designed to only eat certain things to have the enzymes to break down certain foods. We can only break down what? We had hydrochloric acid, pep pepsin. It was meat. We had the enzymes only for meat. Then we started uh, 
developing tuberous things, roots, vegetables, tuberous, fruits, things like that. It wasn't until about five to 10,000 years ago that we started cultivating and creating industrial agricultural industries out there that we started making seeds and wheat and corn and soy. And then when did the vegetable kingdom come? When the broccoli? It, was, it came out of China and India and all that. 5,000 years ago, 8,000 years ago. So our stomach wasn't designed for that yet. We haven't built that yet. It takes 65,000 years to change our genetic mitochondria. 65,000, how many of you have lived that long? Because you can do it now. So understand why we can't change our lifestyle and all mitochondria comes from your mother and her mother and her mother and her mother. The male had nothing to do with our genetics. It's really almost only the mother. So if your mother is European, which most of us are, German or Irish or further, what do they eat? I was talking to a patient yesterday, and, her f and, and, sh and she has a lot of health conditions, a lot of health conditions. And she's young, she's not that old. And I asked, where does your parents come from? And she goes, my mother's from Ireland. What do they like to eat in Ireland? Potatoes. No, what else? They're big meat eaters. Yeah. Big meat eaters, okay? So I said, and you're a vegetarian. How can you survive today as a vegetarian because you're not designed that way? It's all, every human being has a mitochondria and it's designed uniquely to handle certain things. So if you look at a bean, that's how a mitochondria looks like. And you open it up, cut it, inside are different levels of, of cellular chambers that make energy. So people from the north, Germany, uh, Irish, or thing, they have a shorter distance from, cell, from the electron chamber number one, which is the most important chamber called the NAD, and I'll teach you how to increase your NAD, to cellular chamber number five, which is the ATP. The angstroms between that to here is so crucial in determining your health and who you are and how long you're gonna live. You don't know that. Douglas Wallace discovered this. So people in the north have a short distance angstrom of their mitochondria. So they, re they, they have a faster flow of energy across the cell membrane. So they can eat more protein and more, uh, and, and, they'll, and they gotta eat three or four meals to keep that angstrom going. And they survive and they don't get fat. Okay, Europeans are very rarely, you see them obesity, right? You don't see that many of those. It's not until McDonald, In-N-Out, Burger, and every other fast food chain that created the problem today. It's the people in south of the equator, closer to Mexico, South America and all that, their mitochondria is different than the northern people, the Germans or Russians or other people. They have a longer angstrom. Their distance are a little bit further apart. So they can do well on eating less food. And they can do well with fish, shellfish, and some rice, some beans, 
potatoes, they can do well with that because of their mitochondria location and their makeup. And they got one other thing that's helping them, sun, sunlight. Another thing I was talking to an Italian individual just recently and he has, he's worried he has prostate cancer. I don't worry about that at all, you know. Uh, PSA goes up, that's not, that's just a marker, doesn't determine anything. And he loves his pasta and bread, right? Because he's Italian. He likes to eat pasta and bread. So Italians, what did they do in Italy? I said, how does your ancestors live in Italy and how do they eat? Are they indoors or outdoors? Oh no, we're mostly outdoor. We eat a lot outdoors. Well, the sun, every time you eat your food and you're under the sun, when you're outdoors, you increase the electron flow. You increase the metabolism. You increase the oxy oxygen chambers. You do better outdoors than eating indoors. The mitochondria needs light, folks, photon. That's how it works, nothing else. It needs outdoor lighting. That's why people in Europe love to eat outdoors. And they do well. If you eat under artificial lighting, which is LED, uh, fluorescent lighting, all these new types of lightings, you are causing blue light damage and you're causing mitochondrial damage. So this battery that we have starts slowing down, slowing down every single year where eventually something happens to us. Arthritis, heart disease, cancer, diabetes. Diabetes has nothing to do with sugar. Nothing to do with sugar. Because I've reversed over 100 people with diabetes by giving them sugar, a pound of sugar, in coffee, tea, or whatever. It comes from another thing. What happened when the industry around one, uh, 1940 and all the way up, we started changing our chemistry of our foods. That's when illness and disease started coming across. Um, in 1960s, 70s, what happened? What started coming into our industry, in our food industry? Vegetable. No, what fats? Vegetable. Vegetable fats, yes, we talked, Victoria. I have a friend that worked in the lipid chemistry department at UCLA, and I worked a little bit at, um, Buck Institute up in Novato and Stanford. And one thing I learned about fat, how important fat is, the most important nutrient for our brain development, our nerve development, our myelin sheet development, the chemistry of life comes from cholesterol. Cholesterol protects us against oxidative damage, inflammation. And what's today the biggest thing where they're trying to sell us? Statin and drugs. The number one cause of dementia, Parkinson's, and neurological diseases are going to be statin drugs. Well, the farmhand, uh, you know what they did was after the war, World War II, they had all these oils, seed oils. They were using as paint fuels, as turpentine and other things. They needed another industry to make money. So what did they do with the vegetable oils, then these seed oils? Put it in the consumer's meal, in their lunches and dinners and making food. And when that happened, what happened? Inflammation. Inflammation increase, thyroid damage, oxidative damage, mitochondria 
our mind of Congress started uh, being damaged, dysfunction went down. Number one cause of diabetes is seed oil. Not sugar, seed oil. And seed oil is the worst oil you can use. And when we remove lard and butter from our diet because we were getting too healthy and now is not profitable, yeah, McDonald's stopped using animal fat, and that was in the 90s or so. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. They did. Lard was the best fuel we had. So we need to go back to eating butter, ghee, and develop our brain chemistry. And guess what gives us vitamin D when we go outside from 12 to 3 and expose our body? Our body, not just with clothes. You need cholesterol. If you don't have any cholesterol, you can't make vitamin D. And that's why you need fat. So you need to get away from 5G. You gotta expose yourself to more light. Now here's the problem what's happening, okay? I want you to think about going to the beach. And always go to the beach anyway, and walk barefooted. It's the only place you can ground yourself and bring you back to nature because there's no power lines on the beach, right? So you're standing on the beach and you have a wave coming very slow and it hits your feet. How much more time do I have? Because I want to... Well, I want to take a break and then come back for your closing comments. Oh, okay. Q &A. Okay, Q&A. All right, so you're standing on the beach, right? And a wave comes to you and it just gently hits your feet and then goes back out. That's how your body works in the frequency resonance. Your body heart works at 1.14 hertz. That means one cycle per second, almost. So it's like this, very slow. It takes one second to make one cycle, and that's how the heart functions. Okay, what are we introducing today? 5G? Yes. Stand on the beach, and you have a tsunami. Are you gonna survive that? just standing there, it's gonna take you and hit you so hard, it's gonna take you out and it's gonna drown you. That is the frequency of what we are now experiencing. So how's that heart gonna function? How's that brain gonna function? It's in physical diseases, dementia, depression, anxiety, cancer the frequency that we're changing our bodies. We're all resonance. Our body works between one, actually three to 11 hertz. I like one hertz because I know one and 1.14 hertz is the body, is the heart frequency that I work with. So anything in that millions and billions of cycles is what we're doing today. It's called dirty, Energy by Dr. Thomas Young. He wrote it in, way back in the 70s, 80s. He was explaining about all this dirty energy underground over us that's gonna be the greatest health problem we're gonna ever see today. You wanna take a break? Yeah, let's take a 10 minute. And I'll finish up with more things. All right, hello. I'm gonna, okay, I'm rounding down a little bit. There's so much to tell you. <laughs> it's not enough time to really give you a whole explanation of everything. Um, one of, like I said, one of the things that I discovered was by reducing, removing certain things to improve energy, mitochondria, all of that, Number one was 
removing all polyunsaturated oils, really. That's number one cause of every known disease we know of. And people are now coming up, Mercola's talking about it, every, um, Dr. K, uh, K. Bart's talking about it, Paul Saldino, uh, Ray Pete, all of them. So making sure that you look at butter, ghee, and lard, those are the fats you want to utilize. And ghee is excellent for cooking, and that's what I use. Number two, very important, and why the vegetarian world is not the greatest world in the, to be in. And one of the things is, there's a thing of phosphorus to calcium. There's a gene called glotho. K-L-O-T-H-O, you don't hear about it, nobody talks about it. It could be the most important gene we have. It determines our bone growth, if we're gonna have diabetes, cancer, or heart disease. And this gene is controlled by how much calcium we have in the body. And that calcium is necessary in building our bone our teeth, et cetera, et cetera. If we have loss of calcium that's being pulled out by our, by phosphorus, and phosphorus is in all the foods we eat today, it's the, maybe the number, the number two cause of disease is phosphorus. We need to reduce the level of phosphorus and increase calcium. And calcium has always been the key molecule if you ever want to lose weight. Calcium helps with weight loss. That's why drinking milk, eating cheese, those foods high in calcium will do that. People that live the longest in many of the cultures I've studied consume predominantly cheese and milk, and they raise cows and you know, and camels and sheep and goats and consume mostly high calcium food. And that's why they extend their lifespan because calcium has the ability to do so. So there's vitamin D and vitamin K. This glotho gene is controlled by the amount of calcium in your diet, the amount of vitamin D in your diet, and an amount of vitamin K. And K is essential also. It's a quinone. And K also helps with mitochondria. Any quinones have a profound effect on electron transport in the mitochondria. So foods that are high in phosphorus are what? Predominantly what? There, yes, meat does, but meat also is com compensated by good calcium. So your grains, your pastas, your breads are very high in phosphorus. And that's why when you consume those foods, you will lose calcium and vitamin D in your diet. And there's a thing called nutrition data. You can Google it of breads, pastas, anything you want to know, and, it, and you read it and look at the calcium phosphorus levels. That's what you want to do. And you want to keep the calcium phosphorus one to one, two to one. You're not going to get, um, phosphorus is always going to be up there, so you're going to have that problem. So that's why dairy products are very well known in longevity cultures because they are protecting themselves and they're keeping the glothogene working. And that glothogene is going to be a major uh, studies that are going to be happening all over the world at UC Berkeley and uh, especially UCSF is doing a huge study on glotho and we did some at UCLA and that's how we got into it. So, when we're looking at diet, 
What are we? Who are we? What are we made of? There's a thing called net utilization of nitrogen. Anybody knows what that means? Nitrogen is the amino acid complex that helps in restoring and rebuilding and regenerating your body, your body. In the net utilization of nitrogen is how we trainers or uh, professionals work with athletes in, imp in improving performance or enhancing performance and recovery. That means the quality of the protein going into our bodies. The ones that have the highest quality of protein were not any of the plant proteins you're going to see. Matter of fact, all the plant proteins have the lowest utilization of nitrogen. That means they're not utilized well for athletic performance, for rebuilding, repairing, regenerating. Number one, anybody can tell me? Close, very close. Utilization of nitrogen for health, for rebuilding, regenerating, everything. Eggs. Eggs was 0 0.9 on the utilization program. This is, comes from cell physiology folks from universities all over the world. This is how they measure uh, utilization of amino acids for athletic performance, for increasing strength and stamina. And now we can take that information and apply it to human beings to all of us, because that's the key. So eggs came out the best. If you're gonna, the quality of protein is the best. I prefer pasture organic if you can, and don't be afraid of the cholesterol and all that, because that's a good source of nutrients for everything. Number two on the list was milk, cheeses, and the cheese should be only, only from animal rennet, not microbial, not vegetarian rennet. In the old days, they made cheese, how? From the stomach lining, from the pork lining, from all the lining, that's called animal rennet. Cheeses that are made from vegetable rennets, Microbial rennets, lactic acid rennets, causes IBS and Crohn's and bloating, distension, and gas. That's a fact. This is in chemistry. So you Google and find only animal rennet cheeses, and that's what you should be eating. In the, seven, in the 0 0.8 category, the other one that I did all my research in the 84 Olympics, I was one of the only ones that came out with gelatin or collagen. I was the first, very first researcher at UCLA ever to come out and work with collagen and gelatin. Knox Gelatin provided me the research and the tools and the formulas for my athletes. Had no idea what collagen gelatin was in the 80s. No, I did. But then I started working with Knox Gelatin Chemist and discovered that it provides the right protein for increasing strength and recovery and regenerating the body back to health. One of the things we were designing was how to improve quality of performance, making you stronger, faster, and quicker, but also recovering from injuries. My job with the Raiders, Rams, and Lakers was I got to get those players back in the field faster or I'm out of the job. They'll find somebody else. 
My first patient I ever worked with was Howie Long. Probably one of the best defensive tight ends you'll ever meet. One of the brightest guys I ever met. And he came to me with a group of Raiders, all 6'4", 6'7", 6'6", 275 to 340 pounds. And here I am, a shrimp. <laughs> and I'm picking these guys up and lifting them and adjusting them and they can't believe I'm throwing them around the table and putting magnetic devices on them. I use a Lovhosky coil on them. A Rife technology. I was part of the Rife family. That's a whole different world. And nobody today is doing what Rife did. Nobody. They're not using the right coils, they're not using the right frequencies, they're not using the right tubes. None of them. They're all selling things and it's not gonna work. So I took Howie Long with a disc herniation and in, on Tuesday he came in, on Wednesday he calls me in the morning and he says, what did you do to me? I go, oh my God, my first client in the Raiders. I said, why? Well, I came to you mainly for my disc problem, for my lower back, and they wouldn't let me play, you know, until I get that fixed. But that wasn't the question I had for you. I had the worst flu and cold that day, and this morning I woke up 100% feeling normal. I didn't, even, I didn't even work on the flu or cold, but I knew he had it. I put him on a magnetic coil that I built, and it was like spark plugs coming out of it. You know, like, if you ever seen uh, Frankenstein, it was exactly like that. I was uh, creating a new Frankenstein. And he just says, I got, I'm coming back because I've never felt this good, and my back is almost 99% better. So I knew tools how to fix people, you know. That was my sort of gift and karma and working with the Edgar Casey Foundation and all that and doing remote viewing and all that. I connected with some of the most gr greatest minds in out there, you know. Some of the best people you'll never know exist on our planet. I work with, at the SRI with a remote he uh, viewer that 90% of you don't even know existed. He was a tall, slim, former military pilot. And his job was to transform himself in a meditative form to go to a laboratory in China or Russia and bring back all the information, written information back and give it to the CIA or FBI. And I'm standing there and working with him, and this guy is actually writing down dimensions and calculations like nothing else, and he gives it to these people in the suit, and I started to realize what he was doing. And they wanted me to do that, I go, I have no military background, and I can't even fly a plane, so I can't calculate that. So I said, I'm going into medical remote viewing, and if you can help me with that, that's what I came here for. And he says, that's what you should do because this is getting harder to come out. The Russians and Chinese have found ways to intercept him now because they knew he was coming in there. And he was a very interesting person. And the people I work with, you will never hear about them not on television, not on radio. They, the stress that they go through is enormous and they don't want to have the public know about what they can do. So they kept themselves very quiet. So that helped me to discover all the things I got into and why I got into it. And I met people because of that that invented the MRI. 
and I work with them. Raymond Domania, we just lost him just recently. The, he developed the MRI, the only tool we should use because it does not cause cancer. CAT scans and x-rays do, the MRI doesn't. What is our cell made of? How does our cell look like? Every cell of our body. It's round, it's got water, and it's got protein. And in the middle has a thing called cytoplasm. And that cytoplasm is the mitochondria. One of the greatest minds that I had a chance to meet, who was 104 years old, who helped develop the MRI is Dr. Gilbert Ling, L-I-N-G. As a child, he came from China, and he came to the United States, and he discovered how our cells work. It's not a potassium or sodium. It's called Cells and Gels, the Engine of Life by Dr. Gerald Polak. He got interested in Gilbert Sling's work that he wrote a book called Cells and Gels, the Engine of Life. And then he came out with what's called the fourth face of water. And that's a whole different world. You know about deuterium. How many of you know about deuterium? That's a whole different world that has another function in our body that we can talk about, but it's gonna take too much time. But it's all about that every single cell looks like jello. That's what jello is. It's controlled by the phase of the water and the protein and the position they hold each other. And the MRI is the only unit that can look at a cell and recognize how accurate or the health and condition of that body, of that cell is. It looks at the water structure and the protein structure and the chemistry and the physics of that. And if it's displaced, that means the water's displaced out of it, or the proteins are not stable, disease, illness, something happens, and that's how they can determine that. So that's how the discovery of all this occur. Gilbert Ling discovered that it wasn't sodium potassium because that requires too much energy and the cells are too much they need too much energy to function. And that's how the mitochondria became a second discovery by Gilbert Ling and Douglas Wallace. It is this mitochondria, this ATP, that maintains the cell. This mitochondria makes the cell the jello. And if we maintain that, that's how our health is, that's who we are, that's our skin, our cells, every organ in the body, the liver, the kidney, is functioning by that cell, the structure of the water and the protein. And that's why, yes, protein is important. And that's why when I studied this way after I got into collagen, the only reason I got into collagen and why I even learned more so I was involved in caloric restriction diet with Dr. Roy Walford. Roy was a patient of mine who had uh, some injuries from running and lifting weights, and he was a unique person at UCLA. He was the father of caloric restriction diet. And he asked me would I come over to his lab and work with him and learn of what his work is with mice and rats, and then he's gonna start human trials. I said, yeah, I wanna learn all this. And I discovered that what he was trying to do is that life extension is controlled by caloric restriction. Because 100,000 years ago, 65,000, 35,000, it was whatever we can go hunting and come back is what we ate. We didn't have, you know, a, a, a lot of food available. It's what we ate that kept us going. 
And so we weren't contaminating our body with heavy metals, chemicals, and toxins, and inflammation, inflammation, inflammation is the cause of everything. That's what caloric restriction diet was trying to do. It was working very well. Here's the problem with caloric restriction diet that Roy Wolford was doing. And I started realizing because I went with him to conferences. And then all I suddenly he did that Arizona thing where he was in a cocoon in a spaceship, a, a space kind of thing where they can control their own diet and grow their own food and living indoors. He became totally a vegetarian. He gave up fats. And what happened to Roy Walford? He developed ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. I was there for his uh, functioning uh, award-winning night at the anti-aging conference. So what I learned was what caloric restriction diet was doing, it was really reducing the amount of these amino acids that can cause aging and cancer. And what are these amino acids? Anybody can tell me? There's a guy named Richard Miller, MD, PhD, wrote a book on restriction of methionine in human beings can extend the lifespan to 47%. It's the only known studies that can extend lifespan by 40 somewhat percent. There's three amino acids that I learned from the caloric restriction diet. So what we learn in caloric restriction diet, what we learn from the scientists that are out there doing their research and why health, what causes health and disease and extending and expanding age. Methionine is now well known to extend lifespan by restricting it to 47%. Nothing out there works close to it. What amino acids have methionine? Basically everything has a, uh, methionine. All your grains and pastas and plant, all your plants, all your meats and all that, but certain things reduces the ability of methionine. And one of the things in my work with the athletes and then with my patients after working with collagen and gelatin was that they're devoid of methionine. The second amino acid is cysteine and the third amino acid is tryptophan. So methionine, tryptophan, and cysteine enhances oxidative damage thyroid damage and mitochondrial damage. These three amino acids, they're found in your plant foods and your, some of your uh, meat foods, yes, but they're devoid in collagen. And the reason collagen works is they're devoid of these three amino acids that are inflammatory in nature that can cause a major condition called rapamycin mTOR. What is mTOR? It's like deuterium. Think of these two, deuterium and mTOR. When we're young, these two things help to process growth and, and increase growth in our cells, in our bones, in our muscles, so we get bigger and taller, right? And it goes up to a certain age that we grow to. Some of us will grow up to 23, 24, 25, 28. I had one woman that I actually experimented with it and she grew at age 44, two more inches. And that is rare, okay? I did a project and I, I, one day I'll tell you what I did. But after that 25, 28, 30, 35, these two things, deuterium and mTOR, 
changes to grow in cancer cells, can cause aging, can cause disease. We shorten our lifespan by these two materials. How we control deuterium, that's a whole different world. Sunlight can help because deuterium and sunlight don't do well. They reduce deuterium from the mitochondria by sunlight. And deuterium is a heavy hydrogen. And one of the problems with deuterium is it does mitochondrial spin to make ATP fuel is controlled by the spin rate. The faster it goes, the more energy we have, OK? The slower it goes, fatigue, tired, disease, cancer, heart, deuterium does that. Sunlight changes the deuterium level and eliminates it from the fifth chamber of the spin phase. That's what sunlight can do to the deuterium. That's why when you go very north to the colder climates like North Pole or any Canada, there's less deuterium in our water and our soil because we don't have that much sun. We go closer to the equator, we have more deuterium, but we have more sun. Nature has sort of a compensation. People don't know that. Well, let's go to the mTOR now. mTOR is the leading cause of most of our cancer today in heart disease. mTOR requires methionine, cysteine, and tryptophan to increase it. That's why when you take collagen with your meals, you suppress the negative effects of these three amino acids. And I learned that in my work with caloric restriction diet with Roy Wolfert and what he did. Caloric restriction diet would have worked with Roy Wolfert and extended his lifespan to 104, 110. I just lost a woman about nine months ago, and everybody might have known it was on radio and tele, uh, on news, 114 years old. She's out of Atlanta, Georgia. She met, uh, the family met me in 92, 93, uh, and I worked with all of them, and she says, would you work with my grandma, grandma, grandma? I said, sure, put her on a program. She mainly had dairy products, cheese and eggs, and she made what's called old world bread, which is rare. You don't see that anymore. And so she extended her lifespan by to 114. She was outdoors a lot. She was gardening every day. She, uh, I told her, walk slowly every day outdoors. She did all that. She did the right things. That's why it, you can extend your lifespan to 114. Your RNA is designed to go about that high. Who was the oldest man that lived? He came out of England. Anybody? I guess? Huh? No, no. How old do you think was the oldest? 152. He lived in England. His name was, uh, he was studied by the churches, so that's how they recorded him. And he was invited by the king to celebrate his birthday. He's never been out of his, you know, home, uh, uh, from his location, whatever. So they had, uh, they had him come by with a carriage and they had a, prepared a big meal for him, right? Huge meal to celebrate 152 years old. And I heard this from a scientist. This is from a scientist who does a lot of research. And about, about within a year after that, or not even that much after, he died. And so we think it was because of all that consumption of food that he ate, all the you know, the meal, you know, it was funny. So it could be that, you know, I don't know. So, longe so one of the things 
explaining to you is there are things we can do on a daily basis. And why I got into collagen in 84 was because I knew it can reduce the level of inflammation in our body if we eat the wrong foods, but it has the makeup to build and repair the body. Today, everybody, vital proteins came to my lecture, and that's how they got famous, you know? And uh, David Asprey, he didn't know anything about collagen. I taught him everything, and Susan knows that. None of these people except one person named Bob Busher from Great Lakes at that time was working with me with collagen. He was the only one. So I, you know, we have my, if you want to, I have a whole program on Amazon. You can go on there and you can buy all the stuff that I know that works. I know that my collagen works because it is uniquely uh, processed different than anybody on the planet today. I didn't give that information out. It's the processing of breaking the collagen into a hydrolyzed peptide using a prolytic enzyme, everybody uses sulfuric acid. Everybody. And that doesn't give you a true peptide. So I'm still maintaining that effort to do that, but it's costly now. So one of the things I, I want to share with you, so how do we keep our mitochondria going? Get up in the morning, get some natural sunlight, Walk 10, 15 minutes just to expose, get your optic nerve working again, no sunglasses, no sunscreens, and then have a good protein every morning. Have your eggs, omelet, cheese. I personally, in the last two or three years, have completely stopped eating all vegetables in my diet. And I feel fantastic. No, you know, I've always had more energy than 90% of the public today. I ran track and field. I ran marathons without training because of my athletes. I had to train them. I played soccer. I had a mitochondrial function that was unbelievable. Never got tired in my life. So never had a problem. I learned to be wise and I learned to be knowledgeable about how to do things today correctly with not overdoing it. Oxidative stress, I don't want any of that. So if you can get your eggs in, and don't be afraid to have grass-fed beef and lamb as your diet. I truly believe that more protein is necessary. for our own survival, for our own repair, for our own re regeneration. Vegetables have only come into play in the last five to 10,000 years. I, ha I was working with a fellow at UCLA who was researching architecture, I mean, archeology span and he went and found bones of 35,000, 65,000 years old of humans and people within 5, 10, and 3,000 in recent. And he discovered and found out that there was no disease 30, 65,000. He could not find any tooth decay, arthritis, cancer, diabetes at all. It wasn't until the last two or 3,000 years that he saw all this. Why? There was an art around five to 10,000 years ago, what did we discover and started doing? That's right, agriculture. And then indoor living, going inside, not living with nature anymore. Seeds, you know. Um, one of the problems that all vegetables have Eating raw is the worst thing you can ever do for your hormones and for your thyroid. It's called goitrin. They all have an anti-goitrin problem they, and oxalates. They cause thyroid damage. This is a fact. All my patients with serious conditions with IBS, Crohn's, cancer, diabetes, anything, they love their vegetables and they eat them too raw.
If you're going to have vegetables, have them cooked, and they have to be boiled. They have to be boiled, almost to like a mashed potato. If you're going to have potatoes, you got to boil the potatoes to mashed potatoes. Put butter, 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 enhances digestibility of your food. It's indigestible foods that causes the problems, okay? And then again, it, depending on what your problem is, you know, everybody's different. I recommend we don't need that much food at night because we need to rest the body and repair and not work on digesting at night. So having something like warm milk with honey, a Greek yogurt, or something easy, light, you know, is best at night. And don't be afraid of your sugar. If you're gonna have ice cream, haagen or Strauss, have it. It's not gonna kill you, it's gonna, if you are not having enough protein, uh, a fuel in the brain and you have too much cortisol, that's reduced by glucose. Sugar reverses cortisol levels. So I've had people with a scoop of ice cream at night, haagen vanilla, chocolate, sleep like a log because they keep their cortisol down and their glucose up. Raise your NAD levels. That's the fountain of youth. How you do that? Niacinamide. Don't worry, goodbye, NR or NMN. You don't need that. Niacinamide is $7 a bottle. You take two to 500 in the morning, and if you need more in the afternoon, you take another two to 500 in the afternoon. Keep your NAD working. And then I recommend a good B complex in the morning with breakfast, lunch, with every meal, because B2, B6 are critical, critical. B6 reverses depression and anxiety, okay? And then vitamin D, sunlight, or you gotta take it through nutrients. I believe in high calcium, magnesium diet and vitamin E, and I take an aspirin every single day. Aspirin protects against almost every disease we know of today and lowers inflammation. Not ibuprofen, not Tylenol. Aspirin is the only one that does that. It's the only one that reduces all the mechanism of inflammation, COX-1 and 2. In plants, it's Boswella ashwanda. Those work well. Any questions? And by the way, by the way, when you sleep at night, the only protection we have from 5G, from the environment, is turn off everything you have in your bedroom. Your cell phone should not be on. I totally turn it off. No Wi-Fi. I make sure the Wi-Fi, in which I hardly ever have it on anyway, and if you have a circuit breaker, turn that on and turn that off and just leave your environment free of everything, you know? And, and after five or six o'clock, do not use videos or computers or cell phones. You're disturbing the feel of the brain, the chemistry of the brain, which is the alpha, beta, delta. The delta waveline is what I operate when I do remote viewing but you don't get it if you use cell phones or uh, any of these things. Okay, any questions? I have the first two questions, Dr. Yeah. <laughs> They'll cost you. <laughs> so many of the wisdoms that you shared with us are similar to the wisdoms that another doctor shared with us when he presented. So who influenced who? Dr. Joseph Mercola? <laughs> I was, uh, well, when I went down to Chicago to a conference, Mercola was there. He didn't speak about this at all, none of these things. At the time. At that time. I was in that process of starting to come out with all of this, you know. I wanted to wait to make sure that all my evidence was coming out. 
Mercola is now coming into, he was never into omega-6 damage. In the 1990s or 2000 or two, it's recent, the last two or three months. Uh, I met McCullough, I know him. Do I consider him a high energy mitochondria guy? No, I don't. I can look at him, I can do, I can scan him. And I can see he's got, he just started recently, he was more of a marketing guy than I, and he was good at that. And he had a good research group. You know, I worked with uh, Linus Pauling when he had prostate cancer. Uh, but I met his staff, his people that worked for him. So McCullough is coming into his place now, you know. And I, I give him gratitude for that because most of the people I worked around in the eight, 90s, 80s, 90s, there were hardly any mitochondrial people there. Hardly any of this information available about the polyunsaturated oils. The only reason I learned about it, I worked with the lipid chemist people that were involved with the seed oil. And they opened me up to this. So that's where it is. Have you uh, consulted with, or learned from, or taught any of the wisdoms that we hear from Dr. Stephen Gundry? Uh, again, Stephen Gundry keeps changing a lot. He's a big olive oil. Uh, now he's going into MCT oil. MCT oil is one, one of the predominantly things that I got into back 20 years ago, 25 years ago, to increase uh, mitochondrial function. But here's the problem with everything, okay? Um, Stephen has a lot of good information. He's, uh, he's excellent in presenting it. Do I follow him? No, I don't even, no. Here's the problem. When you make a substance like MCT oil or avocado oil, any oil today, and you go to a lab, when you go to a lab, get your blood drawn, what is the environment that it's, you're under? Yes. Artificial lighting, radiation, all of that. Nature, no nature, you don't have any natural things. So. If you're gonna get something, you wanna make sure it's all natural in nature. So everything is exposed to sunlight and temp temperature and all that, you know? And that's the thing about when you do a blood test, you get it done, you have a computer, you have a cell phone, you have artificial lighting, you have fluorescent lighting. So you have x-rays in, in that facility, you may not. And then how long does it take for the processing of the blood before you get your information? I will definitely get my next blood drawer draw outdoors. That's, actually, that's true. That's what you want to do. And that's how you get an accurate reading. And we've done, we've done hair analysis, indoor and outdoor, and we saw a totally difference. Yeah, totally different. When you're buying uh, MCT oil, it's made indoors. It's extracted from coconut oil. I've been involved since the 80s with MCT, before anybody knew what MCT was. And I started learning that, yeah, it changes uh, dramatically in the procedure of how it's done. So, but butter, lard, nature. It still comes from the cow, which is outdoor. It's processed correctly and it's done right. You spoke about eating uh, in harmony with our genetic origin yeah. and the benefits of that. Uh, ever since we've been able to map our DNA to get that information, uh, a new industry has arisen where uh, genetic nutritionists are taking on clients and taking all their their data and combining it with kinesiology and a few other things and altering the diet and the supplements of their patients. Um, are you, can you comment on that? Well, yes, I, heard, I know that's going on and it's very hard to really, here's the problem with these uh, nutritionists who are doing it. How much knowledge do they really have of the chemistry of life? How much knowledge do they have about how UV light 
affected the ozone that gave us oxygen that created the first living systems in our body, in, in, in the planet. To take that into account, they don't have that. Most of your people that are doing, you know, consultations are very limited in the mitochondria. How many of them know about the angstrom distance from, uh, you know, chamber one to chamber five, NAD, then you have F FAD, the third chamber, and then you have the cytochrome oxidase chamber, and then you have um, the ATP chamber. They have to take that into consideration, and most of them don't even know that unless they studied Douglas Wallace. So I'd be careful about anybody saying, we can take your genetics and give you the right nutrients. Basically, it's simple. Keep the NAD up, keep the cytochrome oxidase going with methylene blue or with anything, and getting the ATP working. And basically, it's, it's going back to sunlight, eliminating EMF, radiation, Wi-Fi, and bring back the proteins that are, you know, 65,000, 30,000, 35,000 years ago. That's what we ate. Who is it? Uh, Charlie. Yeah. Charlie. Two, two things real quickly. Are you familiar with Dr. Constantine Buteco? And number two, uh, familiar with uh, LIVO2 uh, high altitude training? Okay, what's the first one? Dr. Constantine Buteco. Oh, Pacheco, the, uh, the uh, Russian fellow. Yeah, the CO2 guy. It's all about can, uh, CO2 breathing and high altitude training, right? Uh, I talked about that. I think um, when you increase CO2, it helps with endurance, stamina, and strength. And that's where Botenko came into. And a lot of the Russians were doing this for a long time. You know, they, they knew, I would say I worked in 78 with the Russian athletes getting them ready for 1980 Olympics, but it was boycotted because of the Russian boycott. And so a lot of the uh, research was from East Germany and Russia at that point. Uh, Botenko is where you take a deep breath through your nose and then exhale it out all the way out and then hold it as long as you can before you breathe again, right? There, well, there's, there's all sorts of exercises, but basically, Boteca said the higher the level of CO2, the better everything is. And that's right. You use a control pause to determine a very rough estimate of your level of health, you have a table of health. He, right. Uh, he says uh, how, how much CO2 you're producing. Basically, he said CO2 was, he, he compared that to prana. Uh, the higher the levels, if you get a control pause of 60, you're, you're disease free, basically. No, he, he, I would say he's close to being correct about CO2 is the ultimate antioxidant we have. And the higher levels we get, the better it is. That's why I recommend baking soda uh, every single day because baking soda increases CO2. Uh, doing any CO2 breathing is important. You know, exercising, uh, increasing CO2 levels is very important. So, yeah, the Russians were doing that for a long time. They were measuring CO2 performances and all that. And I agree. Question, Luann. Thank you. Yeah, um, comment and a question. I was uh, participating in master synchronized swimming. I'm sure you know the sport. Yes. Up until the pandemic started for seven years. I had a teammate, well, if you're not familiar with the sport or anyone else, you're up, upside down, you're underwater running the marathon. Yes. And it's very oxygen intensive. But one of my teammates had a stroke and she had no damage done, no brain damage. And the nurse told her it was because of her synchronized swimming that she had so much built up to hold her through this uh, the stroke period. I don't know enough to understand how that worked, but they credited it with that. Yeah, synchronized swimming is you're mostly performing underneath the water and acrobatics. And so you're holding your breath, right? The more you hold your breath, what happens? CO2 levels go extremely high. 
And CO2 is very protective against any form of diseases. And because she's trained herself to do that, it, it did protect her you know, against a lot of what conditions that, like stroke can occur where you get edema, you get blood flow damage, uh, you know, you lose mitochondrial damage. That's what strokes are. You don't get enough oxygen, you lose mitochondrial function, you get this dysfunction, and then you can get uh, all conditions. But uh, yeah, uh, that did, I can see that. I can see that helping dramatically. Let me ask my question. Um, there is uh, talk astrophysics in the astrophysics world of us heading towards a, a polar shift and adjustment that would change the electromagnetic, I guess, frequencies that we're receiving. I can't explain it as a scientist. Are you familiar with that? And if you are, what might happen to the mitochondria in a period such as that? It, um, we've been taught, we've been looking at shifts for a long time, you know, and it's still, it hasn't happened completely. It's always a slight shift. The mag here's the importance, you know, um, the uh, Earth is very unique, first of all, right? And the way it rotates uh, around the sun is so unique. The distance of the uh, moon is so unique. The moon is the gravitational protection that the Earth has. Otherwise, it would be streaming around the Earth uh, universe and going in unique distances and places. Um, the core is so unique. What's the core? It's iron, right? And the core keeps us in place before, otherwise we'll be falling out of, you know, into the universe. Uh, we wouldn't have gravitational pull and the magnetic field. Uh, the problem is we're changing magnetic gauss all the time. And the human gauss is very, very low, extremely low. We're five gauss, not maybe less. So anytime we work with high gauss, it's gonna affect everything in our body. That's why I think a lot of it, we're, we're, we're gonna have more effects from the dirty energy that they're putting power lines into uh, the underground on over the uh, ceiling. And nobody grounds themselves by going to the ocean. If we go and step in the ocean, walk barefooted in the cold water, we're grounding ourselves constantly and protecting our mitochondria constantly. If we walk on grass, one of the things I did in the 80s, I worked with Evelyn Ashford. She's the fastest woman in the 70s and early 80s. And Pat Connolly was her trainer. And one of the things we did was we trained barefooted on the grass. Never went with shoes on the track, always on the grass. When I played soccer, one of the things we trained was on the grass barefooted. We kicked the ball barefooted but played on the grass, so it's grounding. The shift of the polarity, it's, it's based on a lot of factors out there. Um, is based on the sun, all these other planets that you know, are in the same system. If they go off the line a little bit, we'll change. And then we have that shift, but it hasn't happened yet, and hopefully we won't get that. But there's a lot of, you know, the sun does produce a lot of radiation, and there's a lot of sun radiation burst that comes, and that's what's affecting a lot of our, you know, power lines and things like that. Yeah, everything. Who else has a question? Does cooking eggs destroy the protein? <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up. This, uh, yes, the, the cooking eggs destroy protein. Um, okay, let me give you to, uh, the version of eggs. Okay, raw eggs have a higher antibiotic mechanism. Okay, so if you like raw eggs and you like to make a smoothie, I work with uh, people like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Steven St Stallone and Colombo. They were bodybuilders, but I work with them. 
they were big egg yolk, uh, egg, raw egg consumers. They would do 16 eggs in a, in a milkshake, and that was their diet. So yes, you're getting a higher protein, a, a, a more antimicrobial uh, antibiotic mechanism. Now, if you cook the egg yolk very lightly, like soft boil, over easy, you have a lot more nutrients. The protein doesn't change. That doesn't change no matter what happens. The egg yolk, yes, if it goes, to, if you cook it like hard boiled egg, you're gonna get it oxidized. So you're not gonna get the usefulness, the nutritional support that what the yolk has, which is lecithin and all these choline molecules and other things. I'll give you a remedy. You want a remedy that the Dalai Lama gave to me about 20 years ago, 25 years ago? I thought it was gonna be a gift. I was seeing a lot of patients from Denmark and Sweden and India and Europe, and I don't solicit, I don't advertise, I don't do anything. And I'm wondering one day, I keep getting these patients, and he says, who's recommending them to you? Oh, the Dalai Lama, but I never worked on him. He says he knows you. He's worked with people that know you and what you do, and he believes in what you do with the right nutrients and protein. He's got a gift for you. Oh, I thought he was going to give me something. He was remote viewing you. <laughs> so his gift was this. You take eight egg yolks, separate them, put them in a uh, glass, eight egg yolks, then put them over a little pan, with a little butter or something you ghee and cook them very lightly for a few minutes, very softly, and then you put it back in the glass, cover it, and have one teaspoon three times a day, and it will regenerate your stem cells. That's his remedy to me. And I remember my, uh, my receptionist, Carol, if you remember, uh, you, you used to go to my office, so you, so she, she was really into all this and knew the Dalai Lama really well about his work. And she wrote down and never forgot that, the remedy. And she uses it today. So it's a remedy I was given. I'll give it to you. <laughs> uh, uh, Catherine. Uh, I heard you earlier make mention to rice. I've been using my rice machine for the last 15, 20 years and have found that it has been and if I could find the right frequency, very helpful. Yeah. No, no. And you know, how I got started in RIFE was back in 1980-81, I was part of an organization of people, very rare organization, and I went to the, uh, they invited me to their meeting, in, uh, and it was a group of scientists there in a laboratory in, in Palm Desert. I, I don't even know how I got there, you know, from Santa Monica there. And I was given, uh, it was Stephen Laverne Ross who ran the World Research Foundation at that time. And they, ha they brought the original Rife device, the original microscope, which was about this big. It was prisms of Quartz that would cost about a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand in 1980. Today, millions of dollars. And what Rife did was very unusual. And I studied him like nobody else did, you know. And I was giving all his books and tapes. He uses the machine. He would take the blood out, look at the microscope. And then he would tune the frequencies to see what this destroys that bacterial virus in the blood. And that's how he measured and calculated that patient's frequency. So the frequencies were all scattered, you know, from thousands to millions. Nobody really picked it up because in his days in 1920s, they used, they didn't, they had analogs, not digital, remember? So analog was different. He had to fine tune it so perfectly with his instruments that it's very difficult today to calculate exactly what he did. 
okay? Um, so yeah, there, there are frequencies out there that they claim to cure the cancer and disease. I, they do well. I haven't seen a 100% cure, cure, but they do well. I think the other thing that what he used was plasma, not electrical. And he used vacuums because totally different and analog. So it's a different world when life was existing than today, than what you see today. What I do is I take frequencies more in the range of the human body, which is in the hertz, lower hertz, like one hertz, two hertz, four hertz, eight hertz, nine hertz, 10 hertz, 11 hertz, and that's where I work with. I have to find out what you need. I do it tuning into your own body. And when I find the right frequencies, I leave it on and I change, it and it tells me what the next frequency is. And that's where I get the results. But everybody does it differently. Any other questions? Well, yeah, we were asking why they were trying to reduce the carbon dioxide then, or in Bill Gates' TED talk, one number has to go down to zero, right? That's a whole different, uh, CO2 yeah. is, it's a different comment, uh, because CO2 they're talking about more of the environmental factors yeah. than the actual chemistry of the hemoglobin. This, well, the red blood cells have to carry iron, but you want to make sure in the byproduct of energy in the ATP, it becomes water and CO2 as the final uh, basis for everything. So it's a different world out there. You know, I love when people say that, and I had a fight with somebody that, you know, that uh, cows are causing uh, you know, methane and CO2. I said, no, you know what's the number one cause of the environment today? Besides, uh, no, really going back to weather changes, you know what that was? What did they do to the Amazon forest? The Amazon controls the worldwide con uh, weather for every, part of the world. And it, when you started cutting down the wood, what happened to the rainforest? It got less and less, and you had weather conditions coming up. That's where we have the problems today. Number two, why do we have so many fires? They've been spraying nanoaluminum, strontium, barium, and it comes in incendiary as the plants take it up into their root system. A lot of it is also from the smart meters. That's it. Or dude, or whatever you talk about directly. A lot of them come from uh, the 5G tunnels, uh, uh, cell towers, power lines. That's where we're getting fires from. Smart meter is one of the biggest ones in Napa because that's where they put it all in there first than anybody else. That's where I got all my patients from because they were all very sick there. So that's where the weather warming. It has nothing to do with animals, you know. It's almost worse is how many wheat growers are there today? The Ukraine. <laughs> that's why there's a war in Ukraine. It's because of the wheat, the uh, Monsanto's and Bayer and glyphosate, uh, the Roundup is number one. That's why Russia doesn't want that. How many bio labs are in Ukraine? 100, no, there's 170. Thailand has the second biggest of all. And that's why. Has nothing to do, but the world is changing because uh, China and, and Russia doesn't want to get involved with NATO and West Europe and all that. And the worst countries really is the United States and England. They're the worst. So there's a lot of politics you don't want, they don't want you to know. Okay? And you know, ever, um, who controls basically all the corruption that's going on today? Charles Schaub. World Economic Forum, the World Economic Forum, Davos and Bill Gates, that's the people that want to control the mid middle class wealth and all of that. I was involved with 
the CIA and those, and I got out of it because they told me they wanted to bring down the population of the planet. And, they destroyed the guy. Yeah, and so you, you got to tell your friends and family, be careful. Because they don't want anyone to know all about this. And, you know, the vaccines and all that is, is a mandatory thing to get to control us, everything. It's much more than that. I can tell you much more, but I would cause my friends to lose their position. What do you feel about the infrared biomass with them, the crystals, and can you spend too much time on the mass? Yes. Okay. I, I'm a big believer of infrared, red light. I spend, in 1970, I started working with every device known to man. Infrared, red light, that's how I treated all my athletes. And infrared red light is so important. Uh, I can tell you that you can get a red light device and every day spend three to five minutes, several times a day, and that will help your eyesight, bring back your eyesight, okay? Here's the problem with these uh, mats. Are they plugged into the wall? What's the wall producing? 60 hertz. But what, AC or DC? AC. That's right. So you got to convert it to a DC in order to survive. You know, one of the things that I, uh, I met a guy who really was brilliant, but, uh, Robert Becker, the body electric. Every cell, every electrical stimulation that the body can do and regenerate a new organ, a new bone, a new cartilage is run by DC, direct current, not AC, DC. What destroys that current in the body is AC. So you have to be very careful. Convert. Yeah, you can convert, but how much EMF and electrical and radiation is coming out of there? Get a meter, which I have, test the infrared pads, if it's coming out too high in EMF, like electrical or magnetic, I wouldn't be in that too long, you know? I make everything in batteries. My technology that I create is all batteries. All batteries. Yeah. You want to uh, put that? Um, put it up on the website. Okay. You, put, you can go get yeah. contact information. If you want, yeah. Any other questions? Oh my God! I just gave away two. What? Body electric, huh? I just gave away two. Yeah, I met him when he was in the uh, just doing his research. Yes, yeah, the refugee from Oakland. Yes, yes thank you. Uh, I'm gonna try to like, combine two uh, subjects into one. Um, so you mentioned you were almost eating no vegetables now, but I've kind of been uh, brainwashed into like, oh, make sure you eat your greens. Um, can you kind of elaborate on um, like, are we going to be missing? Um, um, and also kind of, you mentioned something about the raw vegetables. Is, is the eating the raw food, is that start an inflammation process by putting undue strain on the digestive system? And, and like, can you mention how necessary or unnecessary is like the super greens, the, the nutrients that you were told that, that are, we would only get from eating vegetables. And then the last part of my question is, you know, I had a heart attack four years ago. Is there such a thing as good and bad, like cholesterol? And um, can I lower, lower, if it is bad, can I lower it without, how do I do it without the statins if I need to? actually lower it. Okay, question one, raw vegetables and super green and all that. Okay, I look at chemistry of what runs the battery of the cell, okay? What are the fuels necessary, okay? I know that NAD levels are super critical in 80% of the energy that is made in our bodies. I want a high electron transport energy. So I know that niacinamide, 
nicotinic, the riboside, all of those help with NAD, raising NAD levels. What foods does that? Well, if you're going to look at foods, there is really no food that does that critically as, as well as going in the sun and laying out in the sun, you are going to double the NAD exposure even faster by the sunlight because the sunlight is electron photon energy that we need. Here's the problem with eating any foods, fiber, any fiber, solubility and soluble. Most of your vegetables are endotoxins. All vegetables have a critical factor in its protection against bacterias and other pesticides and herbicides. So they built in a defense mechanism in all your vegetables that are irritants to others. So your gut is an irritant to that vegetable. That vegetable becomes an irritant to that because it is that problem. All vegetables, in order to remove that irritant, that oxy oxalates and that goitrin thing that causes thyroid damage, you have to boil it. That's why in, if you go to uh, the southern part of the world, you're going to see people eating chard and kale. They boil it. Nobody eats it raw. Americans do, and now there's a lot of uh, serious problems. I, I was working with a woman that owns a farm, and she sells at the farmer's market in San Mateo, and she overheard me talk about this to another client standing there ready to buy kale and char, and she goes, oh my God, my sister has breast cancer, and she does raw juicing every day. Well, that's an estrogen. All your vegetables are estrogenic. Estrogenic is the number one cause of cancer. That was discovered by three leading experts. Ver Vernon Stevens out of Ohio State University Medical Center, Acevedos, Haran Acevedos out of Cleveland Clinic, who I met, I became very good friends, and Lewis Dean out of MDR Anderson. You need estrogen to drive a cancer cell, to grow. That's what estrogen does. It grows a new cell. All your wines and beers, all your fresh vegetables, and all your grains and pastas and your breads and your seeds are all estrogenic. No way out of it. Estrogenic destroys mitochondria. I told you, I look at things, what makes it work and what destroys it. So in order to negate the estrogen of any vegetable, cruciferous vegetables, you really have to cook it and you don't need to eat them every day. I will tell you one thing you could do every single day and make it your salad, is do a carrot salad. Take a raw carrot, unpeeled, unpeel, and shred it. Put a little salt, a little vinegar, and if you want, I don't use olive oil anymore. I don't believe in any oils in any form other than butter and ghee, and make a salad. You can use tuberous vegetables occasionally, but and, uh, and root vegetables. But vegetables in general are not your best friend. They weren't designed. They were only recently discovered within five to 10,000 years ago, and you come from a 200,000 generation. Vegetables are meant to be consumed by what? Okay. Rabbits and uh, squirrels and all that, yeah. Okay, so now that leads me to remember another question about the food combo, and I've heard this a lot. No carbohydrates and proteins at the same time, so a burger or a sandwich is carbohydrates and proteins and mostly vegetables at the same time. So again, to your point, a lot of that would be breeding your inflammation, but also... There's a lot of people doing that every day. 
basically my question is, I'll answer the other the, one. Yeah, sorry, with the question between the meat and the protein, or meat and the carbohydrates, that, what happens together when that happens? Okay, all bread, no matter what it is, unless you go to Italy and you get it freshly made there, it's made with Roundup. It's, it's actually Roundup. Then gen, uh, the, the genetic uh, fun function of our human body wasn't able to make enough enzyme to break down any carbs. Our existence is basically for protein, hydrochloric acid, and that's why you need to have salt. Every day, you need to drink salt water, and the best salt is canning, pickling salt. No other salt. Canning, pickling salt from Morton is the cleanest, best salt. Not the Himalaya, not any other salt, because they all have lead, iron, and all other toxic components. The only water you should be drinking, and I don't drink water, but don't, is fluoride-free water. So mountain spring water. The best water in the world is ice age, but you can't even get it anymore. Going back to your heart attack. I use you, Martha Q. Huh? Compressed carbon, Martha Q filter system. Oh, yeah. What was that? Multi-filter, filter, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can do that, but still mountain spring, nature water is better. Um, it's better if you get uh, deuterium free water, you know, or lower. But let me finish up his story. Okay, no statin, whatever you want. Cholesterol, heart attacks have nothing, nothing to do with cholesterol. Nothing to do with cholesterol. I mentioned earlier, cholesterol is an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory mechanism that pulls out toxins out of your body. If you don't have enough cholesterol, you don't have enough brain function. What causes heart attacks are seed oils. Number one is eliminate your fried foods completely. Seed oil is number one cause of heart attacks. Number two is phosphorus, leaching calcium out of the bones and teeth into the arteries, blocking the arteries from getting proper oxygen. That's how you get it. Don't ever worry about cholesterol. Eat butter and, and ghee and lard, and you'll probably never have a heart attack. That's the one thing the doctors always And take aspirin. Every night you go to bed, take one aspirin and vitamin E. Doctor, like, harps on me, uh, no matter what. You know what's the, the number one grown uh, industry is statin in the world. Yeah. Wow. Susan knows that. And <laughs> that's because of your culture, your mother. You know why? Yeah. You can have cheese. I can have cheese. That's okay. Yes. Then have cheese. Can you have yogurt? Greek yogurt? Yeah, yogurt's okay. Okay, you got it. Can you have cottage cheese? Cottage cheese, yeah, it's okay. I just gave you three fountains of youth. We're going to take two more questions and then. Yeah, I got it. After Friedlander, after that, can yeah. hang out for 5, 10, 15 minutes? Yeah, I can do a little bit. Patrick, what's your. How do you feel about these plastic bottles you can buy at Lucky that are full of crystal geyser spring water? Good stuff. I'm addicted to it. It's wonderful. Are you for serious? <laughs> Are you are you asking about plastic and plastic bottles? Well, yeah, I, I I agree. I think everything should be in glass. Personally, I believe in glass. So I only buy Gerald Steiner water, which is glass water. It comes from Germany. It's a mountain. It's a comes from a, a special area where calcium and magnesium is extremely high. It's called Gerald Steiner, and Trader Joe's has it. Whole Food has it. That's where I get my water, and that's what I drink. I drink every day fresh orange juice, eight ounces, sixteen ounces of orange juice a day. Uh, orange juice has flavonoids and polyphenols. If you want things that are very crucial to our health are the flavonoids that are found in your fruit juices like orange juice, grape juice, apple juice. 
I know. Huh? Huh? Yes, not like orange juice. Is the best. Orange juice is the best. Alright, who wants to give the last question? Someone over here? Yeah, my legs are falling. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'll ask the last uh, question then. Uh, you mentioned deuterium depleted water. Yeah. Very expensive for most people. Uh, do you buy deuterium depleted water? No, I'm, I'm very good friends with Robert, and I, I, I was given a study project, and so I was donated a lot of deuterium free water. The only thing you can do, like I said, is let nature's have a function in reducing the deuterium out of our body. And the best way to lower deuterium from our body is getting exposure to sunlight. It's the only thing we have. And every time we drink water, drink out in nature, in the sun, and it'll help lower the deuterium. That's all we have. It's just very expensive stuff, I know that. And it's hard to get rid of it, but the infrared, far infrared fields of sun, and, and, and if you do saunas, infrared saunas, it helps to lower deuterium from our mitochondria. So those are the only things we can do. Yeah, I try to keep everything simple and easy. Don't make it so expensive in your lifestyle that you can do it. That's why I got into cancer. I, I, I found a way how to reverse cancer in under $500 a month. And most people can. I was involved with Gerson's Clinic in Mexico. I was involved with so many clinics. And all I saw was how they were doing IVs this and IV that, and then detoxification program and your liver, um, you know, eating, um, making liver, raw liver, which is important. Liver is important because all the B complex are there, but you don't need it every day. Turn that NAD back on get that electron flow going, get that, um, and, de and remove all the toxins from the body by eating the right way and being in the sun. How many have gone to uh, Mexico for cancer clinics? Anybody? Did, were you exposed to the sunlight and told to go outside every day? That's the problem I had with them. I said, why don't you have a area where women can go almost partially new, nude, and men on the other area, and just expose them to the sun every day, plus give them, then you can give them some of the remedies, and it's gonna work better, much better. I agree. Thank you. All right.